fiat. The concern that I have with its future is that the U.S. government banned gold ownership for four decades because of it it being a threat to the U.S. dollar. How concerned are you that if Bitcoin ever presented a real threat to the U.S. dollar, that it would suffer the same fate? So I think on on in general, holding back technology is very hard to do. Um, the United States and China are really the entities that have a lot of firepower to cause Bitcoin um, challenges. One thing to keep in mind is that um, the gold ban uh, in the FDR days was in an environment of super political concentration. So his party had like 70% uh, of of Congress, for example, and so you could you could stack the courts, you could you could override, you could you could just do super majority stuff, um, and that's not the world we have today. So I think that basically, yes, if we were to have a super majority of government that does not like Bitcoin, uh, that really could set back Bitcoin for for quite a while. Uh, it could damage the liquidity of the network. Uh, it could it could force uh, institutional investors to uh, disgorge it. it. It could render it onto the the gray market or black market. Uh, and of course, there'd still be foreign usage of it. There's plenty of hubs around the world that would happily say, okay, build your companies here and it, it, it's it's free to use here, but it would damage liquidity. But I think that <clears throat> those types of draconian things are harder to do if there's not that kind of supermajority concentration of power. It's mm-hmm. also why I do think that some political work's useful. I mean, I'm not, I'm not really politically engaged, but there are other people that go out and uh, you know, talk to senators and congressmen and make sure they understand it. I mean, during this recent uh, multi-week period where there was no Speaker of the House, the acting Speaker of the House, uh, he he's hosting the Bitcoin white paper on Congress's website. And so the acting Speaker of the House and, you know, yeah. for now he's, he's it's still there. He's not the acting Speaker anymore, but he's still, you know, Congress is hosting the white paper. Um and and that's that's the world we live in, where there are senators that like it, there are Congress people that like it, um, there are there are governors that like it, there are presidential candidates that like it. it, and we also have a somewhat independent judiciary and rule of law, and you can point to things like the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, and there's context in that where, for example, in the 1990s, Phil Zimmerman. Um, got in legal trouble for introducing open source encryption to the world and uh, the U.S. went after him, but they they eventually lost because they couldn't get past the, the First Amendment once he published the code in a, a book. Uh, and I think that Bitcoin has similar methods to try to protect itself from the most draconian um, pushback. So what might a transition to a more Bitcoin-based monetary system look like? Like what are the main technical obstacles that need to be overcome to really get that that widespread adoption because it seems like right now what you were saying is that stable coins are the big thing that uh people in countries with a weak currency are adopting a stable coin just for anyone listening who doesn't know it's basically a cryptographic token that is redeemable for a national currency like a us dollar so in a sense People are still hungry for U.S. dollars. What would have to change for that hunger to turn to Bitcoin? I think a lot of it is just liquidity. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so when Bitcoin traded $1,000 a day, uh, a millionaire couldn't just go in and and put a million dollars into it without moving the price. The the overall liquidity and saleability were low. When Bitcoin traded millions a day, someone couldn't just come and put a billion into it. Um, without moving the price. And even today, when it trades billions of dollars per day, um, uh, you know, there are very large pools of capital that, that if they're not careful, they can move the price. It's just not, it's not a big liquid enough market for them to really kind of um, go in significantly. It's, it's still not, it doesn't have enough money properties for them yet. It has money mm-hmm. properties at lower levels, but the, the bigger you get, the less liquid it is. <clears throat> and so it's, it's still a tiny fraction of the overall dollar monetary system, which is much bigger, much more liquid, uh, much more entrenched network effects. So I think that part of it is just going through a handful of more cycles. I mean, it has the benefit of absolute scarcity, so it's growing at a lower rate. Uh, in addition, developers keep building on top of it, so there's more layers uh, so that can be using it. There are better wallets, better user experience. Um, <clears throat> part of what... Um, you know, I originally discovered Bitcoin in like 2010 or so, and it's one of those things where in order to get it, you had to like mine it. And then like I would revisit it a couple years later, like I didn't buy any or didn't didn't acquire any. And I would, and I would kind of look at the exchanges and they'd be really sketchy looking. 
and you had to like wire money to like you know japan and then like it was like this whole thing mm -hmm. and then of course it became much easier to do it and then the wallet technology became much easier to use and so part of it is just the ux gets better over time the liquidity gets better over time and then of course every year that goes by people try to find more ways to break it or centralize it things like that so it's kind of like it's being tested for its hardness you know can someone find a way to you know, break the overall technical capabilities of the Bitcoin network. And every year that goes by where that doesn't happen, the, the Lindy effect on it is strengthening. Um, unlike most technologies that can be adopted very quickly and smoothly. So, you know, most technologies you adopt like the smartphone, you never go back to, to not having a smartphone. You don't adopt electricity and then go back to not having it. A new monetary technology is different because unlike those, uh, it can be levered. Uh, and so if, if it starts to go up in a smooth pattern, people will realize that and leverage it mm -hmm. and then they will make it a bubble and it'll crash. And then people will actually de-adopt it. They'll be like, well, I, I, I messed up. I shouldn't have bought Bitcoin. It's a scam. And they, they get out. And then Bitcoin has to spend a few years rebuilding from people that actually, you know, deeply follow the, the network and understand what's going on there and say, okay, there was a, there was a local bubble and it's going to work itself out. And then they kind of re re come into the network <clears throat> on the next cycle. So by its very nature, it's going to adopt basically in a cyclical and longer taking way. And I think really it starts to challenge dollar one of two ways, either just the sheer liquidity and size of the network eventually reduces the volatility of it. You know, if it's held by um, just, you know, a billion people around the world in, in some small way, that's less volatile network than one where, you know, some like guy with crazy hair in the, in the Bahamas can like, you know, <laughs> manip manipulate the price. It just yeah. gets harder. Um, and, and two, um, uh, the United States dollar does have some kind of long-term fiscal challenges with it now uh, mm -hmm. that we've not really seen in a very, very long time. Um, and so eventually the dollar can enter a more structurally inflationary uh, problematic period, um, kind of like what Japan would look like <clears throat> if Japan had a trade deficit uh, mm -hmm. and had a, these, these other kind of challenges. And so I do think that either the dollar can hurt itself or Bitcoin can just keep gathering liquidity and technical proof and 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 just overall better UX, assuming again that nothing, no one finds a way to hack it, centralize it, censor it, um, or otherwise disrupt it. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from my conversation with Lynn Alden about her new book, Broken Money. You can watch another clip right here or the full conversation over here.